Okay, so um, so let's just say he's planning this sometime between his mission and 1980, which is when he kind of breaks on the scenes. That's I I either forgot about or didn't know that about the second anointing. This gets to my again my question that I'm most curious about is motive. I was listening to an interview uh, of Richard Turley that he gave recently. And he gives some motives for Mark Hoffman. He wanted money. He hated authority. He just wanted to stick it to the man. And then I think the third thing he says is he wanted to rewrite history. And I I have a fourth motive that I think is most interesting to me, which is this. He was hurt and or sad or angry about the church deceiving people, or he felt like the church was hypocritical. And he wanted to do a long game of exposing you know, my big two questions are, did he want to hurt the church or get back at the church for being so deceitful and dishonest? And did he want to take people out of the church because he would have known that they were under the church's influence and power, not from informed consent, but but through deception? Do you have any thoughts about that? Any reactions, thoughts, feelings about that? I don't think he had enough emotional interest in people that he would have been concerned about other people being deceived or the future of harming people through deception uh, by the church. So I don't, but I think he wanted to force the church to own up to its problematic history. So yes, I think he was trying to get back at the church not necessarily to rewrite church history, but to make them face what he felt their real history was. But I don't think he cared about whether the church was deceiving other people. I think he was. Why, why not? Because I don't know that he had that kind of empathy for future believers. I or think cur- his anger current. at the church <laughs> for his own family and his own life um, but I don't know the, how much he'd worry about other people being sucked in. When you when you read about like, and I'm kind of sketchy <laughs> on all this, but when you read about like Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, you, you find out these tales of him, I, and I could have this wrong, but like dissecting live animals as a kid or just with, with kids in the neighborhood, super troubling kind of behaviors. That, that, it, with Hoffman... Do we have any accounts from anyone that would say, A, that he just didn't care about other people all growing up, teen, adult, young adult, or B, that he did show the capacity to care? I mean, because clearly his wife loved him, his family loved him, all his ward members thought he was great. So do we? do you have any reason to believe that prior to 1980, he didn't care about people? No, I would say that my feeling on that comes more from the fact that he could so callously kill his friend Steve and lace the bomb with nails, yeah. which deliberately was intended to shred the man's insides, and that he could so callously put a bomb at the Sheets' home that killed Kathy Sheets, and then he could dismiss it so easily by saying, well, anyone could have picked up the bomb. I mean, he just showed a total callousness, at least after the murders, uh, when he was asked by the parole board, I think, uh, about Kathy Sheets' death. Uh, it's like, well, she could have gone across the street and got hit by a car. So, I mean, a, a total uh, disrespect for life or for people. Yeah, and I that was a really, that was in part three of the documentary, and that was... It was Margie's most, Margie was most interested in part three. I think it was the most fascinating part. Yeah. What I'm trying to tease out is, is that the sort of justification, desperation, kind of like twisted, motivated reasoning that he acquires once he gets too far into the con and too far at at personal risk and jeopardy where he just starts to throw care and concern about others out the window is that something he develops between 80 and 85? Or do you do we have any reason to believe that that's how he always was? Oh, uh, boy, don't I don't know. You're basing it on the 85, not yes, on anything I'm, else. I'm basing it on the yeah. end of his life, not okay. 
or the end of his career. <laughs> yeah, I want, who would know this question I'm asking about his show of empathy or caring or remorse prior to his forgeries? I, I as I, it's been a long time since I've looked at the Silito book uh, called Salamander, but as I recall, I think they had a little more background on his early life. Yeah. So, so maybe, I, that would be, if I were looking for that, that's first place I would go check. Okay. Okay. So what I hear you saying is you don't know about him care yeah. as far as a motive, him caring about other people in the church broadly being deceived, but you hold open the possibility that he could have been angry at having yeah. been deceived right? or that maybe some of his immediate family members were deceived. Right. Yeah. And then I think he also had the ego uh, to think I can pull off the ultimate deception. I can deceive the guys that perpetrate the deception. So some ego there. Yeah. Because if I'm thinking, and we're, what I want to do now is kind of jump into his forgeries. Yeah. But even I, the one I didn't have here is the is the second anointing one. Yeah. But as you th as as we start looking at the forgeries that he picked, and by the way, I learned from Gerald's book, not all of them were faith destroying. Right. He 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 created some forgeries that would have been very faith promoting. Right. But um, but when I think about the topics he's generally addressing in the forgeries that I'm aware of, which which starts now with the with the second anointing document, but then when you think about the Joseph Smith the third blessing, the letter to Josiah Stoll, the eighteen twenty five letter to Josiah Stoll, um, the the Salamander letter, um, you know, and then if you think about him ultimately shooting for the McClellan papers documents and the hundred sixteen pages, he seems to be picking the some of the most volatile issues that would strike most at the heart of the church's truth claims. Now, part of the motivation could have been just uh, because these are documents the church would have been motivated to care about and want to buy. But another possibility is it's like, no, once these documents get out there, and I and by the way, he made sure that they got out there, yeah. it's gonna be it's gonna be a way to wake people up about troubling church history. When they were asleep about it or unwilling yeah. to face it by by scholarly means yeah. or otherwise were asleep to or just didn't care. Does that make sense? Yes, but I don't know how much of that had been because he wanted to do something to help people as much as to embarrass the church. I think it was more a matter of getting back at the brethren to expose them as uh, deceivers that they don't really have the powers of discernment they claim. They can't even tell a forgery. So how can they have all this great knowledge about God and Joseph's visions and everything when I can make up documents that are just as good as Joseph's and they accept them as authentic? So I see it all as really getting back at the brethren. You, you do think he was motivated by that? Yeah. I think he, he wanted to embarrass them. Do you think you wanted to take people out of the church, bring the church down? Well, I don't know if bringing the church down is the same as trying to take people out of it, because I think that implies more care for people than I give them credit. I, but I think he would have uh, been happy to have um, been the cause of Mormonism's collapse. You think he did want that? Yeah, that's. He wanted to. I think he wanted to show the world that the whole thing was a uh, fraud from day one and he could do it as good as Joseph Smith. Yeah. Cause if, if we're trying to pursue this theory that he had some type of conscience, at least originally and had his own emotional profile of sadness or anger or frustration, then if he's trying to take the church down for being deceivers, you have to answer the question, how could he justify being a deceiver to expose the church as deceivers? It would show hypocrisy, either hypocrisy and or cleverness 
thinking that he's being clever. Like I'll I'll beat them at their own game. Yes. What do you do? You have? Any... I think it's be, trying to beat them at their own game. Yeah. You think so? I didn't mean to plant that statement. <laughs> no, I think that's true. <laughs> to, to, the, the, that he was trying to. Yes, he was going to one upmanship on Joseph Smith. He could do it better than he did. Yeah. Yeah, that if Joseph was deceitful and if the church has been deceitful, what better way to expose them as deceitful than by being even better uh, at deceit better than at them? <laughs> I, do you think that— Well, I don't think he wanted to be known as a deceiver at the beginning. I mean, I, once the he went to prison, then he's glad to be known as the greatest forger in history, but I don't know that he— early on was aiming for that reputation. I don't know if he wanted to be found out. I guess one could speculate that subconsciously maybe he wanted to be found out. Uh, but he seems to be just trying to keep a con going of, uh, I don't know what he'd planned to do after the 116 pages, but obviously all the Martin Harris documents were trying to establish Martin's handwriting so that when he finally came up with something that as a part of the 116 pages of the Book of Mormon, that they would test it against the handwriting samples that Mark had given them earlier <laughs> that he had written. Uh, so who knows what he would have tried after 116 page. That would have been a fascinating thing if he'd have really done that. Yeah. Yeah, like, and part of what gets this really mixed up is that he it becomes his livelihood at some point. So yeah. he's got a wife, he's got kids, he's got to make a living. He takes that leap of faith at some point where he tells Dory, I'm going to do this for a living. And then once he's in, this is his reputation, this is his livelihood. And that can really change you when your livelihood and the livelihood that you're supposed to provide for your, for your family is all wrapped up together. And so I can see those five years as really being a lot of pressure on him to to pull this off and make this all succeed. And it becomes a Ponzi scheme at some point, you know? Yes, and that sounds very much like Joseph Smith. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because once he realized he had to support his family, he's got to keep coming up with something more to keep his church together, to keep it going yeah, you have to keep coming up with new scriptures, new claims to keep the following because along the way he gets a lot of people mad and they drop out. But he finds himself in the same problem as Mark. You got to keep coming up with something exciting to keep the following and keep them to believe you when things don't work out. Uh, just like Mark can't come up with the documents to supply all his claims working himself into a financial hole. You have uh, Joseph Smith coming up with all kinds of claims and getting the church into financial difficulty. And then he's got to come up with more claims, more discoveries to uh, get people reengaged and all excited. We're going to go build Zion. Well, we're going to do it in independence. Well, no, and that got scuttled. So um, we're going to do it in Kirtland. That scuttled. <laughs> we're going to do it in Far West. No, well... Okay, we're going to do it in Nauvoo. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe Texas, right? <laughs> yeah, Texas or Oregon, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yeah, okay. 